On January 15, 1907, Tom Egan, the most powerful gangster in St. Louis, saw a familiar face walking to the Jolly Five Club. This man's name was Willie Gagel, and he knew Egan for years. However, these two were not on good terms. Eleven years beforehand, Gagel killed a young gangster named Jerry Caples. As a result, Egan resented Gagel and swore that he would avenge Caples' death. So when Gagel began speaking to Egan, Egan just shot him through the abdomen without a second thought. Despite this, Gagel did not reveal his murder to the police. As a result, a frustrated sergeant told a rookie cop, they're all rats, that's who they are, these guys that are with Egan. That's how the most notorious gang in St. Louis received their name. This is the story of Egan's Rats. The story begins here in what was the Kerry Patch, a poor Irish neighborhood along the river. Tom Egan was born November 1, 1874. He was one of six children, but at an early age he would lose his mother and three siblings to disease. But even if someone survived this neighborhood, prospects in life were not high. One joke of the time is that those growing up in the Kerry Patch could either become a cop, a priest, or a criminal. Therefore, Tom Egan would begin his life in crime during his teens. One of Egan's closest friends was Thomas Kinney, later known to the public as Snake Kinney. Being six years older, Kinney would become an influential figure for Egan. Kinney worked a variety of jobs, but entered local politics in 1890 when he was elected to the Democratic City Committee. Meanwhile, Tom stayed on the streets and formed the Ashley Street Gang, the members of this gang also had rough childhoods, so they were looking for any way they could get ahead. These boys were pickpockets, purse snatchers, shop vandalizers, and armed robbers. And then there was Snake Kinney, operating the Ashley Street Gang behind the scenes. Uh, back in the 1880s and 90s, in St. Louis, and not just in St. Louis, but in Missouri in general, crime and politics often went hand in hand with each other. Men like Kinney, used thugs like the Ashley, Ashley Street Gang, which eventually became the Kenny Egan Gang, to enforce their will, not just at the polls by intimidating voters, but also beating up those that are assault, physically assaulting those that wanted to vote for rival candidates. But they were only one gang out of many during the 1890s. While their relationship with Snake Kinney helped validate their power on the streets, the Ashley Street Gang, now called the Egan Gang, was not the most powerful. That belonged to Edward Butler's gang. Butler was a politician who had incredible power in office and on the streets. He played a part in every bill that was passed in the city, and the young men he met before politics were willing to do his bidding on the streets, especially during an election. They essentially functioned, I guess the best way to put it would be as political strong arm men. You know, by today's definition, we probably call them political terrorists. The embryonic Egan gang in the Ashley Street gang phase and in the Kinney gang phase, they, when they first got off the ground, they had to pay, play catch up a little bit because the Butler machine was still the party to beat in the city of St. Louis and pretty much the eastern half of the state of Missouri. However, Butler's power would be gone by the early 20th century. To make a long story short, Edward Butler and his personal liaison, Bad Jack Williams, would become too notorious. Jack Williams' saloon would close down due to violent actions, one example being the shooting of racetrack gatekeeper Joseph Graham. Williams would die at 29, and to make things worse for Butler, he would become prosecuted by Joseph Folk, an attorney Butler endorsed for the circuit court. By 1902, Butler and his gang would be arrested, and Butler would eventually be found guilty. In the meantime, all Kenny and Egan had to do was sit back and watch in order to gain power.
it was a very very hard I mean, there was a lot of uh guns and a lot of egos and you know, just a lot of disputes that they had with each other ended up turning violent by the tide started to finally turn against the butlers pretty much by the the 1904 elections in the world's fair the big, that's when snake kenny was elected to the state senate and uh, butler for all intents and purposes got knocked out of the box especially when he lost bad jack williams and basically the his, his chief strong arms in the city of st louis so for the first couple years yeah uh, the kennys and egan's were like number two if you will but they eventually just through sheer force of will and attrition and a couple of other factors they overtook the butler williams faction if you will so it's the early 20th century and once the butler machine had become irrelevant tom egan had become the most powerful gangster in st louis combined with his old friend and current state senator snake kinney the gang would become untouchable snake kinney was quite unusual in american criminal history i mean he was a respected politician, but he's also at the same time what you would call a crime boss. With him in the state house and controlling all the different political wards and all of the upper world stuff that went along with that as far as controlling ordinances, getting in with the police department, that just enabled the Egan gang to give them cover for whatever kind of misdeeds they wanted to do. Tom Egan was so powerful that in 1912, he would admit in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch that he was a mob boss participating in criminal activity. In the last eight years, I've built up a following from the 300 to 400 men, not all of whom who live in the Carr Street District. I bound to them myself by signing bonds without fees whenever they or their relatives appear in court. I gave them turkey dinner on Christmas Day, and the same day I dispersed several hundreds of dollars among their friends of mine who were in the penitentiary. In return, the boys come to me at the Democratic primaries. I'm a Democrat, and they'd ask me how they shall vote. I tell them. I protest strongly against the nickname of Egan Rats, which the newspapers invented. If a man spoke that phrase in certain parts of St. Louis, he would get his block knocked off. My friends are not rats. But men of principle, having more honor among themselves than there is among the best of the gentlemen in St. Louis. We want nothing to do with the police or the courts. We don't want to prosecute or be prosecuted. If we have any wrongs to redress, we do it ourselves. We look at it this way. Supposing a man is killed, he is dead. What good would it do for us to help send a man who shot him to the penitentiary? His work there would do us no good. In the meantime, the prisoner's wife and children might starve. If the dead man's friend wants to take that matter, that is their business. My following is not a formal organization. There's no elected officers, no constitution, and no bylaws. They're mostly men who were raised in the same neighborhood, who have the same politics, and who have the same unwillingness to give the police the slightest information on any subject. That was actually one of the more astounding things I found when I started doing research on this years ago. I mean, here's this guy. He calls an interview with the, the city's main newspaper, and he basically just brags to the world, yeah, I'm a gangster, and basically he's daring them to do something about it, but he knows that they won't. Tom Egan was an essential part of running the city. Even though he might not have been officially the mayor of St. Louis in 1912, he was just as integral as to running of the, the city of St. Louis as the actual democratically elected mayor was. The Egan's main rival at this time would have been the Bottoms Gang, led by Tony Foley. They started off as political rivals, first confronting the Egan's to see which Democrat would control the 15th Ward, which was currently controlled by Thomas Kinney. If you, if you had a, political, a powerful political backer like Snake Kinney, you could be successful in this line of work. but. The later uh, political gangs in the city of St. Louis, like the Bottoms Gang, weren't. One, because they didn't have quite as powerful political backing. And two, they just weren't as adept at staying out of trouble, well, staying out of the police's way, for one thing, and committing crimes. Even though they tried to settle this peacefully the night Willie Gagel was killed, the Bottoms would continue to draw too much attention to themselves. On April 14, 1908, the Bottoms would break into City Hall, waving pistols and cracking small whips because gang member Eddie Carroll wanted revenge against Lewis Marks. 
a man who recently fired Carol. Marx wasn't there, but that didn't stop Egan from becoming disgusted by the Bobbins' behavior. It was bad for business, but he couldn't do anything about it himself. They were a rival gang, and engaging in open combat would draw too much attention. So Egan decided to use his contacts in the police department to take care of the Bottoms. They would regroup every few years, but the Bottoms lost power quickly. As for Tom Egan, around 1910, he believed that prohibition would become law in the United States. Therefore, he wanted to make sure the Egans had plenty of liquor before it was outlawed. There was a, a push to enact uh, the 18th Amendment in 1914, and it only fell about 61 votes shy of the necessary two-thirds majority to become law. And Tom Egan could easily see that eventually alcohol is going to be outlawed. So even at this point in time, 1914 to 15, he went around to all these different cities in the Midwest and South and set up whiskey smuggling uh, networks. Egan's liquor smuggling network had connections in Chicago, Cincinnati, Kansas City, Detroit, Terre Haute, and New Orleans, and that wasn't everything Egan did to prepare for prohibition. In 1910, Jack Daniels moved production of their whiskey to St. Louis, Missouri, because the state of Tennessee had outlawed uh, alcohol. That move was facilitated in no small part by Snake Kenny and Tom Egan. Unfortunately for Egan, he would not reap the benefits from prohibition. He was diagnosed with a kidney disorder known as Bright's disease in November 1918. He died April 20th, 1919, and would be buried at Calvary Cemetery, along with Thomas Kinney and Egan's older sister, Catherine. At this time, Tom's younger brother, Willie, would become the new leader of Egan's Rats. When began in the 20s, things were great for the Egans. Tom Egan's liquor network paid off, so bootlegging became the gang's primary form of income. However, while Willie tried to run the gang like Tom, the brothers had very different personalities. Because uh, Willie Egan wasn't quite as iron-fisted of a leader as his brother was, he started letting these young guys kind of just go off and do what they wanted as far as, like, making money. And so they immediately started occasionally sticking up bank messengers because they weren't really all that protected. It's easy pickings. And then they occasionally started robbing banks. In fact, I think the first bank they stuck up was uh, just a couple of weeks before Tom Egan's death, which, quite frankly, I don't think was a coincidence at all. So while Willie only wanted to run his saloon, William Dent Colbeck became a figurehead for the young Egan rats. Before Prohibition, Colbeck was a World War I veteran and enjoyed dangerous, thrilling situations. Therefore, the rats would begin robbing banks on top of the money they made from bootlegging. The first bank they robbed was Baden Bank on Broadway. Pretty soon, they got addicted to the instant gratification of fast money. It was at that point in the Egan story when al alcohol was outlawed that, quite frankly, politics really started to take a back seat in the Egan gang because one, they're making insane amounts of money from bootlegging, but also because a lot, they got, a lot of young guys are gravitating to the Egan gang. And so these hoods, they go into Willie Egan's saloon at 14th and Franklin, they're looking for easy money. They don't have patience for the methodical business of importing and smuggling whiskey. This helped the Egans remain the most powerful gang in St. Louis, since many of the liquor smuggling networks Tom created no longer associated with the Egans. Willie wasn't interested in maintaining contact, so they ended up splitting and forming their own separate groups. That was a key moment in uh, the gang's overall decline. When all those individual cells in the other cities kind of went off on their own, that immediately put a crimp in, like, the flow of whiskey that could come in and out of St. Louis. When those cells went off on their own, they turned the Egan whiskey smuggling network from, say, a $50 million business down to a roughly $10 million one. Willie Egan was the head of the Egan Rats for two years, but that all changed on Halloween night when Willie was assassinated by a rival gang, the Hogans. This would start one of the greatest, bloodiest gang wars in St. Louis history.
To recap prior events, Edward Hogan and Tom Egan were both political rivals, but Hogan would begin to develop a rivalry with Willie Egan. Edward Hogan's political career came in towards the tail end of uh, Tom Egan's reign on top. Basically, the Egan brothers saw him as a distinct rival for power, not, not quite necessarily in the criminal sense, but most definitely in the political sense. There's evidence to indicate that uh, Jelly Roll Hogan and Willie Egan had been each other's, at each other's thrones for the better part of a decade before Willie Egan's murder in 1921. After Willie's death, Tint Kolbeck would become the new leader of Egan's Rats. While he had more drive than Willie Egan, he would run the gang differently from Tom. Uh, Tom Egan and Din Kolbeck were similar in the fact that they both had very strong willpower. They were both extraordinarily savvy. But one thing that were different about them is that uh, Kolbeck uh, really couldn't multitask quite as well as Tom. Kolbeck kind of let the, the political stuff go to waste. Before going into more detail about the upcoming gang war, where would the Egans hide out? Tom Egan's saloon was shut down years ago, and while they tried to move elsewhere in the city, the locations never worked out. For example, one location was close to the police station. That's why they moved here, the area that was the Max Walton racetrack. Back then, it was perfect. It could accommodate all the gang members, and it was outside the city limits. The only people living in the area were a handful of farmers. Anyway, how did the Egans retaliate after Willie Egan was murdered? First, they had to find out who did it, and Colbeck would reveal that the killers were Luke Kennedy, John Doyle, and James Hogan. Two months after Egan's death, on December 30th, five Egans would find James Hogan, Luke Kennedy, Abe Goldfeder, and Hogan lawyer James Mackler and open fire on 11th and Market Street. No one was killed, but the public was outraged that these gangsters would try to kill each other in the middle of the day. At the time the Egans and the Hogans uh, had it out in the early 20s, they were the two most powerful gangs in the city at that time. Hogan was building an increasingly powerful political base because unlike uh, Dent Kolbeck, he recognized full well the advantages of having political power, just like his predecessors did. But th the thing was that uh, Hogan wasn't quite as adept a uh, street gangster as Kolbeck and the Red Hots were and that is reflected in uh, their conflicts on the street. Keep in mind, the Hogans were considered a joke in the St. Louis criminal underworld before Willie Egan's death, but now they were taking on the most powerful gang in St. Louis. This back and forth between the Egans and the Hogans went on for months. In late February 1922, Dent Kolbeck was almost assassinated when he was driving back on St. Charles Rock Road. The last event in the gang war happened on 3035 Cass Avenue, Edward Hogan's home. On May 19, 1922, at 11.20 in the morning, three cars filled with Egan's opened fire on the house. Even though Edward Hogan was the boss behind the retaliations against the Egan's, Hogan's family also lived there. They had nothing to do with the war. They were able to get away with the murders because despite uh, Kolbeck's uh, neglect of the political side of things, he still was spreading a heck of a lot of money around with the authorities and with politicians. And that's how they were able to uh, escape prosecution so much. So they were able to hold their own for a little bit, but over time, the balance of power just tipped their way. You know, just the quality of uh, soldiers on the Egan side were better than those on the Hogan side. Like the shooting on Market Street, the public was outraged that the Egans would be so audacious, despite the fact that no one died. It was at this point that Father Timothy Dempsey wanted to discuss peace between the rival gangs. During June of 1922, at St. Patrick's Church, the Egans and the Hogans would call a truce. More than a few members of the gang had went to his church, and they trusted him implicitly. And I think that's one of the big reasons that uh, Father Dempsey was able to broker a truce between them on multiple occasions. Father Dempsey believed that there was good in all people and that, they had, that while these men, gangsters or not, could be dealt with and talked to as human beings just like anybody else. In the meantime, robbery had become the gang's primary form of income. They still managed a large illicit beer operation, but it got to a point when older members of Egan's Rats pleaded Colbeck to focus more on bootlegging and not robbery. The Egan's heists were also hits and misses. Sometimes they'd make hundreds of thousands of dollars, but other times only a few thousand. At the time, uh, 
bank robbery was not a federal offense in the early 1920s, and it wouldn't be for another decade or so. So a lot of times when the Egans would stick up a bank in Missouri or across the river in Illinois, all they had to do was just quickly hightail it across the bridge and go across the river. And then as long as they stayed there for a certain period of time until the heat cooled down, they were essentially immune from prosecution. St. Louis was pretty much the bank robbery capital of America in the early 1920s. Just the sheer number of them that were being staged. One of the most notable robberies wasn't the bank, but at the Jack Daniels warehouse on Duncan Avenue. They got together with gangs from Indianapolis and Cincinnati so they could drain the whiskey and fill the barrels with water. The planning took months and the cost of the job was over a million dollars. It was hard work, but the profits from the job brought in over two million dollars, not adjusted for inflation. This was probably the most successful robbery the Egans pulled off. So far, we've seen the Egans get away with murder and robbery, and at the start of 1924, they were still the most powerful gang in the city. But things would start to go wrong very quickly. It all started with the mail order robbery in Pocahontas, Illinois. At the time, it felt like most of the other robberies, but there was a difference between a bank robbery and a mail robbery. One thing that really turned on it was uh, the mail robberies. That's what ended up doing them in because mail robberies, unlike bank robberies, fell into the jurisdiction of the federal government. And that's where they finally got tripped up. Also, middle tier Egan rat named Ray Renard was beginning to worry about his place among the rats. Just like any other gang, if you mess up and no one in the gang likes you, you're going to get killed. Renard and another gangster named Eddie Linham were supposed to take the fall for the Bocahannes robbery, even though they had nothing to do with it. They both protested, and one day, Dent Kolbeck took Lenham in the back room and shot him. Renard knew he would be next, so he ran. He ran all the way to Tijuana, Mexico, and that's where he planned to stay, until he decided to return to St. Louis. When Renard spoke to Kolbeck, he told him that he would be turning himself into the police. After a couple months in prison, Renard decided to send the police a multi-page letter explaining his role among the rats and giving insight into their criminal activities. I get the impression that he thought by rolling over when he did that he would be able to either get out of prison or maybe get out of prison sooner. But I also think it might have been just out of spite. The Egan gang had grown very cliquish over its last couple of years with Colbent and you know his little you know Praetorian guard of uh, guys, and I think that uh, Ray Renard had grown to resent that. With the new evidence, the high-ranking Egan rats were arrested. These members included Dent Colbeck, Chippy Robinson, Steve Ryan, Oliver Doherty, Red Smith, and several others. Some of these men were Colbeck's right-hand men, willing to carry out any order he gave. If only Coldback was going to prison, one of the other men would have taken over the rats. One of those guys would have made a play for leadership. There well, there well, could, well could have been a civil war within what was left of the Egan gang over who's going to run the show. And there may have been a whole fresh wave of killings. But with Coldback in prison, any one of, the, of his four gunmen, they might not have had the wherewithal to keep the cops and the politicians off their back for much longer. After these men were tried for two different acts of robbery, they were sentenced to over 25 years in federal prison. Defense attorney Patrick Cullen did his best to make Renard look like a non-credible witness, but his attempts were in vain. After the trial ended, Renard would finish serving his seven-year sentence in Atlanta. In 1925, he would begin telling his story with the rats in an interview with the St. Louis Star. Yeah, I found his testimony fascinating, but like all mob informants, his testimony is also self-serving, and there's a couple of holes that I can poke in it now, knowing what I do before I wrote the book. Quite frankly, in retrospect, I don't really buy his story for coming back to St. Louis. I don't know why Renard came back to St. Louis, but uh, indeed he did. But yeah, it just I get the impression that Renard was, very, was a rather self-destructive character. As for the remaining Egan rats, they didn't last long. They tried to go back to bank robbery, but the police were too familiar with their antics. So what did organized crime in St. Louis look like during the rest of the 20s? Probably the most powerful gang in Prohibition after the Egans got knocked out of the box, believe it or not, was the Cuckoo Gang in South City that started out in Seward. They controlled pretty much all of South City and parts of uh, West St. Louis. Uh, they were extraordinarily tough. They were extraordinarily violent. 
probably the smartest of all the St. Louis area gang leaders were actually based across the river in East St. Louis. That would be the Sheltons. The Sheltons were very savvy. Uh, basically, the, the Sheltons were to Southern Illinois, let's say the fictional Corleone family was to New York. So that's the story of the rise and fall of Egan's Rats. They use politics and brute force to become the most powerful gang in St. Louis. But through greed and overconfidence, their criminal empire that lasted over 30 years was destroyed in a matter of weeks. As of now, their legacy resides in the hidden history of St. Louis. While people all over the United States know about Al Capone, Tom Egan receives little to no recognition in this city. Many of the landmarks in Egan's story have either been repurposed or demolished. There's a lot more to this story. There are many Egan gangsters with unique personalities and motivations that made an impact on the history of the rats. Skippy Rohan, Fred Burke, Senator Mike Kinney, they all have their own side notes in the story. But one story at a time.